But the only difference between Joe and myself is that Joe can stand on a chair and not fall off. <laughs> I'm not even going to try, uh, because I'm quite sure I'd fall off very quickly. But uh, I would like to say, if I may, how nice it is to see so many people here, so many people I don't know, in fact, um, who've come here since, well, since I left a long time ago. My wife was saying, who the hell are these people? And I said, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> <laughs> but I do know one thing, and that, that is that they have all, you have all, in fact, got some debt to those among us, and we're going to celebrate two of them this, this afternoon, uh, who in fact have devoted their lives to bringing this place forward uh, years and years and years ago. It isn't as though it started in 1963, that was 30 years ago, it started in 1950. Uh, and in fact I remember very clearly it starting because I came here as the second professor. They wanted in the university, they didn't want a professor who just administered, they thought they'd like a professor who did some research. <laughs> and I was brought in to do this research. Um, Archie Black was the one who was supposed to keep the place tidy um, <laughs> and, and everything else. But I was supposed to give a new ethos to it. And this was really very, very difficult because there was very, very little research going on. There was one little bit of research, and Jeff Lilly will be interested in this, because Jeff, who was at Cranfield at the time, he had a little wind tunnel, supersonic wind tunnel, uh, and he brought it down here, um, and it was hooked on to the steam system. <laughs> uh, this was going to be the first supersonic wind tunnel driven by steam. <laughs> um, and I remember we, we, we hooked it on and we ran it, and from then on, all the electronics went wrong. Uh, they, the steam went all over the laboratory, everything got stinking wet, <laughs> and it, we soon learned that in fact you didn't use wet steam uh, to, to run sort of delicate equipment uh, <laughs> to on the wind tunnels. And that was the kind of quality that we were having to deal with. I remember we could never get our structural experiments to balance, um, until in fact we thought it would be a good idea to weigh the the, the lead shot to see whether the lead shot was right or not. And we found that the lead shot had been pilfered <laughs> <laughs> by some of the people in the world. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think they used the fishing, but I'm not sure. They may have stolen it. Uh, but there were lots and lots of things like that. And I, I started moving in that kind of way because the first thing that I, I decided to do was we must have a research program. It's one of the nice things about starting with a blank sheet is you don't really have to fit in with anybody else. You, you just start from where you are. And uh, incidentally, the, among the young ones among you today, it is very likely that many of you will be in the 92 universities or number, whatever number it is now, around the countryside, many of which are just starting on this endeavor of building up a scholarship uh, in themselves. I think you may well find yourself going to the University of Glamorgan or somewhere like that where they've never heard the word research, let alone done any. Uh, <laughs> and um, you may well have to sort of think, well, how do I start it? I came here in the same sort of spirit. I'd been a designer of aeroplanes at, at Weybridge um, and I decided, well, I would do the things that I knew about, namely the problems that were assailing Vickers at that particular time. And so one of the things that they were having trouble with was the noise of jets. Um, chiefly at that moment it was the noise of jets inside the aeroplane. Uh, but in fact we, we very quickly started realizing the problems were going to be much more severe. We, the second Viscount aeroplane, people don't realize this, the second Viscount aeroplane was fitted with two jet engines. Um, and it flew around called the Tay Viscount and the rivets went popping in every direction <laughs> and we very quickly realized that should be a big group on, on acoustic fatigue. Uh, and that's how the acoustic fatigue side came into being. And then in fact the same sort of thing about jets and things like that. It was very obvious that we knew very little about jets. Um, the one thing that had happened on noise of jets was that James Lighthill had produced a very, very highly scientific paper on the noise of jets. And it was a very difficult 
paper to read and to realize that what he had done was to transfer it from uh, a problem of noise to a problem of very complicated uh, functions of turbulence in and around the mixing, mixing region. And we started working on that kind of field and this is really why it is that at that particular time lots of people came in with a knowledge of turbulence and jets and of mathematics and things of that sort. It was necessary to try to, to put a shape to the relationship between noise and vibration and uh, the mathematical uh, structure of the jet that was being formulated. Well now, this afternoon I'm being asked to give my name to the um, uh, library, not the university library. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at Loughborough now, they're much more decent people. <laughs> they felt that it would be an insult for me to give my name to the library. <laughs> and so I had a whole of residence named after me, which was much more fun. <laughs> and I have lots of these athletes who have been part of my soul now, uh, which is quite a, a bit because they wouldn't have done very well if they were part of my body. <laughs> um, but... Seriously now, the question of the library is a very important part of any system where in fact you have to go searching for knowledge. Uh, and <coughs> we found when we started that nobody wanted to publish our papers on noise. Um, we wrote to Phil Mag and we wrote to the Journal of Acoustics, Acoustica and magazines like that. They all wanted to stay in the classical kind of role of acoustics as it was known whereas we wanted to break away and talk about the noise of equipment, the relationship between mechanical equipment and the noise coming from it. And so, in fact, we started off with creating uh, technical memoranda and uh, technical reports and things of that sort, but it was only after about two years I realized that all that happened to those things was that they were sent to eminent professors uh, to read and they went on their shelves and stayed on their shelves. There was no circulation, there was nowhere where the young people could get hold of them. So we decided, well, we'd better rather think about uh, how to create our own library and how to create our own uh, journal. And um, I remember very much, very clearly, the first essay at this. Um, I was approached in a, a, a nightclub in Palermo <laughs> <laughs> now, don't think that I'm always doing this, and I would like to say to my wife, and I'm very seldom have I done this. <laughs> um, but I had a message that came across from the other side of the room um, from a fellow called Captain Maxwell, um, who finished up, you know, rather worse for wear. <laughs> but he wrote and said, uh, Would you like to come over and talk? We'd like to talk about the idea of a journal. Of, uh, of, of, of acoustics and I went over to see him and he said I've got this idea about a journal it, it's got to be published in Russian uh, German and English I could cope with the English in spite of it not being my language <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, the, the, the German and the, uh, and the Russian I, I felt rather doubtful about but I, I let him go on a bit and you know two days later back at home he rang up at two in the morning and he said, I've got a title for this journal and the title was to be Cacophonos. He said, <laughs> he said, Cacophony is a word which is the same in German, in Russian and in English and would be a wonderful title for a journal of sound and vibration. Um, well, at that time I, was, I thought, oh dear, I'd better look into this a bit more. Talk to a friend of mine who was the director of the Camelot Press, which is defunct, uh, and he said, good God, don't touch that man. Uh, he's, a, he's a terrible man. Uh, and so, in fact, um, I went off that. A little bit later, along comes the, ca the academic press, uh, and uh, we arranged, in fact, that we should take over the uh, journal, which was to be called Journal of Sound and Vibration. Philip took over the chairmanship. Philip Doak was here today. And I think you've got to say that the editorship, which in fact Philip has followed for so many years now, 
has been one of, one of the best jobs done by anybody uh, in the editorial field uh, altogether. Uh, and I, I'm very pleased that in my small way I introduced it to him uh, and that we've had a good journal that we've been able to publish nice and easily uh, ever since that and it's still going on even, even today. It was the second best selling journal of, of academic press which is saying an awful lot um, and uh, I think that it has given them reputation as well as us. And so in that sense the library uh, had its journal and in fact we in fact had a publication outlet uh, for our articles and things of that sort and that has been very helpful and especially to you young people in fact who will have things to write for it in the years to come. The other person who has been sort of uh, honoured today is Peter Davis. I always remember that. Uh, I had a letter from Peter about 1956 or so, so and saying are there any vacancies in, in, the, in uh, Southampton? I don't know how many places you wrote to Peter, but it must have been quite a lot. Uh, but we couldn't afford to go out and interview him, so uh, the professor of education was going out there at the time, and so I said uh, to Professor Wagner, his name was, I, I said, uh, Wags, could you interview this chap and tell me what you think of him? And he came back, he said, well, he's a brilliant man, but absolutely uncontrollable. <laughs> uh, and this was very interesting because I'd not had a controllable man uh, yet working for me, so uh, I immediately took him on. <laughs> and in fact, both Philip and uh, Peter, uh, Peter, uh, Peter have been very, very stalwart supporters of the Institute ever since. I think we owe a great debt to both of them and I'm delighted that they are going to name uh, laboratories after them. I know, I know you're going to say things about this in a, in a moment. But um, in the meantime, may I say how honoured I am to give my name to the uh, library uh, and um, how I hope that you will all use it. Uh, take the books away, don't bother to bring them back. <laughs> <laughs> Um, have a good time with them, but for God's sake, read them and understand. So thank you very much.